Jesus was definitely trying to get across to the Pharisees and scribes at that time, particularly in this parable, that he was looking that there would be a law-gospel distinction. He takes two characters, he takes three characters, he takes four characters, and begins to illuminate through a little moral spiritual story this, the, the parable of the prodigal son. In typical Jewish fashion, the older brother would get double the inheritance as his siblings. The younger brother says to his dad, I want my money now. Remember the commercial for, was it J.D. Wentworth? I want my money now. Yet what he's saying in that reality is, you have become dead to me. You're going to give it to me anyway. You owe it to me. Give it to me now. And the entitlement mentality leads him from a place of haughtiness to a place of absolute humility and bitterness. Was this kid ADD? Was he ADHD? Was he anxious? Was he depressed? Was he frustrated? Was he all the things that we take you know, medications for today that he was a little bit nutty and saying, I want my stuff now? Or was he suffering with a super huge case of being discontent? Now I'm going to tell you, it's my thought process, that he was a malcontent to, the, to a massive degree. As we are all malcontent to a massive degree. We're always doing something on what, what's the bigger, better deal for me? What's in it for me? We're, we're, we're FOMO, fear of missing out. You know, I, I'm in the business of comparison. And what we know is that those things have a tendency to cause a massive amount of consternation and problems. And it does. It causes some anxiety, especially when we're in the business of comparison. But he compares himself to the world and says, I want my money because he knows what he's going to do with his money. It's already pre-planned. He's not going to the stock market to invest it. He's not going to start an orphanage. He's going to rock and roll and party till the cows come home. When we find ourselves in the midst of sin and we find ourselves going against what the Word of God has to say, we find ourselves in, in a season of discontent, we are going to do what, exactly what Jonathan Edwards says. We always do exactly what we want to do according to how it's going to make us feel at any given moment. And that's a problem because we, we get absorbed in the moment and we don't look out what's going out in the distance. We tend to be what we call myopic. What is right in front of us right now? And we, we make decisions based on what's in front of us right now, not what is necessarily going to be better for us. This kid knew what he was going to do. Did he ever consider, holy mackerel, there's an end to the party? I don't know exactly what riotous living this kid does because it's a parable. But let's, let, let's take it for what he did. I mean, there was, there was a no bars hold kind of attitude. He had the money, he could afford all the good things. And that's exactly what he did. He was riotous. He was prodigal. He took his money and he wasted it with reckless abandon. There was nothing left. What does it profit a man to gain the world, yet lose his soul? He gained everything that the culture and the world would tell you that was good at that moment, right? Let's eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we may die. And he imbibed and, and ate and all that kind of thing until there was nothing left. And his friends helped him do it. And what good friends he had to help him do all that partying, right? Hey, you got to go to the store. We're running out of this. And you get to the store and run out of this. No more money. Here's the problem. And if you've ever had champagne and filet mignon, it's better than burger, fries, and Coke. Burger, fries, and Cokes are better than dumpster diving. So there's four humiliations for a young Jewish boy finding himself in the hog pen. Number one, he subjected himself to a pagan. If we look at the preceding parable, when we're talking about the Good Samaritan, which is worth investigating, the Jews of that time did not think that that was very lofty at all. As a matter of fact, they thought the pagan was very low. Number two, he had to feed the pagans pigs. What do we know about Jews even today? What don't they eat? They don't eat pork. They don't eat pigs. So imagine, not only are you humiliated from that standpoint, but the fact is, now you're feeding what you would never eat yourself. Number three, he's not even eating as well as the pigs. Now that's got to be humiliating because he doesn't eat pigs. He's not supposed to eat pigs. The pigs are eating better than him. So now he realizes in a caste system that he's lower than what he values as low. Number four, no one gives him food, not even the slop. So he comes to this conclusion. Even my father's servants are treated better than this. So he looks at what he would never participate in. He realizes the caste system that he finds himself in lower than the swine. And then comes to realize, I've got to come to my senses. And the scripture says, he comes to his senses. 
which means now he thinks about what is going on, the decision that he makes, the gravity, the weight, the encompassing of the bad decisions that says, look it, this is no good. I am in a bad, bad place. There is nothing good that can come from this at all. He realizes that he has sinned against his father. Is this not the great revelation that we have as someone who's walking around lost? And then we come to our spiritual senses that we begin to realize that we have sinned against our heavenly father. And that's the analogy. He's talking to the Pharisees and the scribes. So every allegory, every little type and shadow that he's putting inside of this parable, they should understand. And they should understand it in full because these are the things that they were teaching to the Jewish people at that time. And so when they're talking about do this, do that, jump higher, run faster, try harder, you got to give your best, you're not working hard enough. They understood that. And then along comes Jesus and begins to deconstruct all of these ideas. He hems us into the idea that, you know what, we're not going to keep the law. You mean to tell me, do you really think, does anybody here really think that the scribes and the Pharisees of that time kept the law perfectly? No. When we run from the law, we have a tendency to not come home. When we run from grace, we have a tendency to want to come home because grace forgives the sins that we have committed. So think about the idea. He says he comes to his senses, he realizes he has sinned against his father, and he wants to go home. Think of every time when you were a little kid and something went wrong, what did you think in the back of your mind? I just want to go home. The Wizard of Oz, there's no place like home. And so the home becomes something different. He wants to run back to his father's estate. He wants to run back to his father's arms. He's already been humiliated. He begins to recite what he's going to say to his father. I've sinned against you, father, and only against you have I sinned. I'm not worthy to even be called your son anymore. Put me in line of your servants because they, they're doing better than me. At least they're not humiliated because they know their place. They have food to eat. They probably have a hot shower. They probably have a cot to lay on. They have things that I don't even have anymore. And so he goes off to home.